Welcome to my Full Life and Faith Leaps podcast with me, Tiffany Jo Baker, where we help you experience God's power and rest in your purpose and progress as you move forward step by step in all the things God has called and created you to do at home and around the world. Hello, y'all, and welcome back to my Full Life and Faith Leaps podcast with me, Tiffany Jo Baker. Today, we're going to be talking about a topic that none of us really want to deal with or top, talk about, but a topic that nonetheless, we all deal with, and it is what to do when you're disappointed with life and God. Just a few weeks ago, my husband, Brian, and I um, did an episode on the three little things that end marriages, and one of those little things is an unmet expectation. And so that's really what we're going to be talking a lot about today is when life doesn't go as planned and we have to deal with this disappointment in life and we have to deal with our disappointment with God sometimes. And so today I brought on with me Lori Ann Wood, who's going to be sharing a little bit about her journey and what she's learned and her new book that has recently been released divine detour. The path you'd never choose can lead you to the faith you've always wanted. Lorianne, it's so nice to have you here. Thank you for joining me today. I'm so thrilled to be here, Tiffany. Thank you. I know you are in Arkansas. I am in Texas. So we're like considered Southern girls, I guess. But um, this is our first time getting to talk. And so I'm excited to dive into your, your story a little bit. Um, I know it's not a story that you would have ever chose to be walking out. Um, but before we do that, sometimes I like to have our guests be introed by the people who are closest to them, what they would say. And so I think Lori's first answer is maybe one of my favorite ones that has ever been answered on the podcast. And so the first one is, what, how would your husband describe you? What would he say? And you said, my husband would say, I'm like winning the lottery. I love that. <laughs> that I love the sense of humor. I love the, <laughs> the real life um, marriage humor that you have. And I sure, I'm sure you are like winning the lottery. Um, <laughs> I would go on to say your kids would say that you're a safe place to land. Your parents would say you're convicted, which might also be a nice word for stubborn. Your readers might say you're vulnerable and honest. Your friends might say that you're intuitive and dependable. And you would say that you're resilient. And after reading a little bit about your story, I would say resilience is a spot on word to describe you. Um, just to give y'all a, just a brief overview, Lori Ann had a serious diagnosis after being almost like in perfect health to where this was just in 2015. She almost died from heart failure from an unknown cause. Her heart was functioning at just 6%. She spent 14 days in the ICU as doctors tried to save her life. She was transferred to the Cleveland Clinic where she became her doctor's most critical patient for a year and a half. She was eventually implanted with a pacemaker, an internal defibrillator, and against all medical odds, her heart function was initially restored 16 months later. But as all heart failure goes, our Christian faith goes, it's been an up and down experience since. That's right. Lorian, thank you for being just here and willing to share a little bit So just to start us off, how or when did you first realize that you were disappointed with your life, Mm -hmm. disappointed with God? And, and, you know, were those so separate events, um, in your mind or in your journey or, or did that happen all at once? Like, how did that, how did that go for you? Mm -hmm. It's a good question. I, you know, sad, that's a sad realization. I think that they happened at once. Mm -hmm. Um, I was... I was equating the goodness of God with how well my life was going at the time, with how closely my life was to that pre-planned path that I had planned out. And when they didn't match up, I started questioning if God was good. Mm. 
And this heart failure journey that I've been on has been really the springboard to that. Um, like you said, I, it came out of nowhere. I mm. was in wonderful health. I had a, actually had a medical evaluation three weeks before I was diagnosed. And they said, wow, your numbers are so wonderful. You have less than 3% chance of ever developing heart disease. Wow. And you know, that didn't surprise me because I don't have any family history. Mm -hmm. I don't have any risk factors. And yet I found myself in the hospital in ICU and, you know, looking back, I shouldn't have left the hospital mm -hmm. by all intents and purposes. And that was a, that was a tough time because I also figured out, as you mentioned in the intro, that this is just a lifelong thing. It's a chronic progressive disease and it can go up and down and you can have your good days and your bad days, but ultimately it only goes in one direction. And when that really sunk in, mm -hmm. I think I started to question if all this that I had believed for so long mm -hmm. was really real. And did I really believe it? And was it really something that was going to do me any good? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, I'm so relating in, in some ways because I grew up in a very, in um, a very faith filled Christian family, you know, on, on the more charismatic side and just believing the promises of God and standing on them. And then I, you know, and then I started going through things and um, I am so thankful for that heritage and foundation of faith. But I did have to go through that crisis of faith moment too, of figuring out where is God in our suffering? Where mm -hmm. is God in our pain? And even though he's not the author of it, what does he do with it? How do mm -hmm. we reconcile that? And, you know, I'm still on that roller coaster sometimes um, of, of the faith and suffering and um, pain and purpose and and all of those things. So I think that's a, a place that a lot of us have found ourselves or will find ourselves. Um, you know, I have a really good friend too, who came from the more suffering side. She grew up in, in, in a family that was more and their church was more focused on the suffering and pain side of our faith. Mm. And so I've been able to bring in more of the faith side mm. of of it and the, and the promises side of it. And so I think there's, there's this dance between the two and without Holy Spirit leading us through that and having that relationship with him and being able to question and to go back and forth with him on it. Um, I can understand how some people's relationships can just end when a crisis of health, faith, relationships happens. Mm, yes. Yes. And I think one of the things as you were saying that that came to mind is I really had to learn how to lament. Mm. And I don't think I, you know, I talk about this in my book. I don't think I really even knew what that meant. Mm -hmm. Um but really lamenting is just this passionate expression of grief or sorrow or disappointment, you know, and you were talking about the two parts of faith. Mm -hmm. a, a lament is like that because you're a believer, but you're hurting, Yes, you know, you, yes. you have this confusion, but you still have trust and you have this complaint, but you still are faithful. And it kind of feels messy because mm -hmm. you kind of got your feet in both worlds. Um, but once I really leaned into that, when this diagnosis started to sink in, you know, I see it in the Psalms, in Lamentations, yes. Ecclesiastes, you know, why, where are you? How mm -hmm. long? And even Jesus, why have mm -hmm. you forsaken me? Mm -hmm. It's so powerful to think about lament because it feels a little bit like we're being unbelievers almost when we, we when we lament or we're being unfaithful but when you think about it lament is a solid statement of 
I'm in this because it says, number one, it says, I believe that you exist, God. I believe you're there. I wouldn't be talking to you if I didn't believe you were there. Yeah. And, you know, that's a big step when you're hurting, but also you're saying, I believe you're powerful. Mm -hmm. I believe that you can do something to affect a different result. Mm -hmm. I believe that you can, I'm holding you accountable for this situation. Mm -hmm. And so you're honoring his power. And also you're saying, I believe that you love me. Mm -hmm. Because I wouldn't come to you and I wouldn't complain to you Mm. and I wouldn't pour out my heart to you if I didn't believe you loved me. So lament is such an important part when we're in a situation of disappointment or we're in a situation of pain to be able to say those things. And it really reinforces that you do believe he's there. You do believe he's powerful. Mm. You do believe he loves you. And I had to really learn that because that was not something that I grew up with either. Mm-hmm. I, I, I remember, and this wasn't many years ago, looking up the definition of lament right. and, and starting to study it little, a little bit. I haven't done a deep dive in it, but um, I loved all those things that you said and the nuggets that you pulled out of what, what the foundation of lament is and that it's not from a place of doubt. It's from a place of faith that we mm-hmm. are able to lament. Um, mm-hmm. because of our security in our relationship with God and in who he is ultimately. Mm-hmm. Exactly. So you go through this, this life change, this huge disappointment. And I, I'm, I'm sure you almost maybe even went through the stages of grief, you know, uh, Dabda and somewhere in that cycle and, and may still, you know, hit mm-hmm. different things through that. How, or where has God really shown up for you in the disappointment? I think one of the things that helped me and, and kind of the really where the title of the book came from is realizing that at some point we're all going to be on a detour. And you alluded to this earlier, whether it's relationships, you know, losing a child, losing a dream, bankruptcy, you name it, we're going to be on a detour. And at some point it hit me that God didn't promise us an easy life. Mm -hmm. And he also didn't promise us a resolved life Mm -hmm. that we would get to see the end of the story arc. And I think about, you know, the apostles, Stephen, John, the Baptist, did the story make sense to them in their lifetime? Mm -hmm. Probably not. And, and yet we can see the end of that story now, but Mm -hmm. at the time that had to be, completely confusing, completely devastating. And yet we want to believe that our little story is going to end in our lifetime. And we're going to understand all those broken ends that we experience, which we've not promised that. Yeah. And, and maybe God has something more for us than just a predictable life. Maybe he has something else in mind for us. And I think by keeping open to that and being able to say, I don't know where this detour is going, but I know the one who's leading me and I know the one who's walking through it with me. Hmm. That's so good. And, you know, I think of those like Hallmark movies, especially the Christmas Hallmark movies where it's like, (laughs) they're so predictable. And it's almost why we as humans, like, even though they're so cheesy and so predictable, I can find myself watching them because (laughs) sometimes we crave that predictability because our life is so opposite of that. But, Mm -hmm. you know, being able to stand on and stand with God through that. And like you said, um, our resolve isn't on this side of heaven. And on this side of eternity. And as believers, this is just a brief blip on our timeline. And it's so crazy to like really think about that. Um, But when we even just kind of go there a little bit, it can help us help give us a different perspective um, on on the life that we're living today. For sure. And I, I think we sometimes think that, 
you know, we're part of this eternal story, just as much as all the people in scripture were part of mm. the story, but we tend to diminish our part, like we're mm. kind of a footnote or an end note, and we're just as big a part of that as they are, but we can look back at their finished story and see, and somebody else may be able to look back at our finished mm. story and see the result as well. Sometimes, maybe not even always in, in anyone's lifetime though. Oh, that's so good. I love that you said that, that we're just as important and significant as the, the, the heroes of faith that we read about because we're all, all his kids and we all yeah. have a part in the body of Christ to play, you know, and I always say this, some of us are hands, some feet, some head, some heart. And, um, but it takes us all working together to mm. do life and to bring his kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Okay. So your book covers what you call the three questions every life must answer. Can you tell me briefly about these three questions? And I know people are going to want to know more about them and they can read it in your book, but the three questions that every life must answer. Yes. You know, the, the book was born of this diagnosis and sudden illness, but it's really not primarily about the medical events. It's about these three questions, and it's a guide to help readers confront the three questions in their life. Because as I struggled through this disappointment and detour and, and, and doubt and mm -hmm. all the confusion that came with that, I realized that they're essentially the same three issues that Jesus faced when he was in the desert. Mm. And all of, all of my angsty journal entries and all of my middle of the night thoughts and all the scribblings I made fell into these three questions that I had about life. And the first one, if you remember in Matthew 4, Jesus was led to the desert right before his public ministry. And he, we call him the three temptations and the enemy tempted him three times. But if you think about a temptation, there's always a question that rises in your mind because you're saying, is this worth it? Am I making the right decision? And so the first one, uh, the enemy said, tell these stones to become bread. Mm -hmm. And Jesus was hungry really hungry. And the question that had to be rolling around as he's fully human in that moment is, is this life all there is? Is my survival and my comfort mm -hmm. and my immediate needs the most important thing? Mm. Because, you know, if it is, and if it is for us, then eat that bread, mm -hmm. do what you want, you know, live for yourself. And so that question I called the question of worry, is this life all there is? Are these immediate things that I'm running around doing every day, all these fires that I'm putting out, is that what life's about? Mm. Just live for the moment. Mm. And so I explore that in one section of my book. And then I go on to the second question, which is when Satan said, throw yourself down essentially jump off this cliff and the angels will protect you. Somebody's going to come and scoop you up and you will not even strike your head against a stone. You're going to be safe because you're God's chosen favorite person. Mm -hmm. God is going to reach down and just not let you get hurt. And, you know, what, what we hear is if we're a believer, if we're a follower of God, he's going to protect us. We're going to have an easy life. We're going to have a life that makes sense. We're going to be guided in all of our decisions. And so when that, when we're up against that, this question of doubt, is God always good? Mm -hmm. Because what I'm living in my life doesn't feel good. Yeah. And, and do we, you know, does my, the level of pain that I'm feeling right now indicate God's level of care for me? Is it a one-to-one -one correlation? Mm -hmm. And why doesn't this feel like love if you tell me it's love? And, you know, I wrestled with that throughout, not just heart failure, but we can all wrestle with that mm -hmm. through different things that happen in our life that are disappointments mm -hmm. and detours. And then the third question is when Satan said, bow down 
to me and all of this, all of the kingdoms that you see will be yours, everything you can see. And we face this question of control also. And we're thinking, is God's plan enough? Because this other thing is really alluring to me right now. I'm, I'm hearing things. I'm seeing things. I'm wanting to do things. I don't know if his plan's enough. Is my life bigger than God's plan? I may, maybe I have a better plan. Hmm. And, and we wrestle with things like disappointment mm -hmm. and waiting and failure mm -hmm. and trust. And you wonder why you're on that dead end detour. If this is God's plan, why am I on a detour? And, and all of those things I examine in the book and try to take the reader through examining those in their own life. Because we all face them, whatever kind of detour we on, we're on, just like when Jesus was detoured into the desert before his ministry, we have to face them and we have to answer them and we have to move on with the rest of our lives. It's so good because I think, as you said, a lot of us have had those thoughts and those questions, but for you to be able to put them into words and put mm -hmm. them into context um, what a powerful resource for people to be able to help them through their detour and through their journey. Um, you know, here on, on this podcast, we talk a, a lot about, you know, our full lives, our, our busy lives, but also our blessed lives as far as the abundant life that Jesus has for us. And I know as you've been journeying with chronic illness, your ability, physical ability has waxed and waned. And so, you know, maybe before you were uh, able to do so much more than you're able to do now, I don't know. And you can speak to that, but in this process of this new reality, what has God taught you about productivity and progress and purpose, even though what you're doing doesn't look like what you did before. Yeah, that's, that's great. You're, you're very perceptive eh? <laughs> to know <laughs> that chronic illness really does take a toll in fatigue and just being able to do the things that you used to be able to do. And it's, sometimes it's, even more difficult because it's often invisible and people can't see that. And we all judge with our eyes. It's just what we do as human beings. But I, I felt cheated honestly mm -hmm. by the disease because I didn't discover this in the early stages. It would have been a better outcome if I had, but this is a life limiting illness. I will not have a normal life expectancy. And I felt cheated in years by the disease. You know, I can look at my children and say, this is, you know, I'm going to miss this and this and this. And I was angry about that for a while, but I also felt cheated in just hours in a day because I can't, I have a need for extra sleep, extra rest. Sure. I have to cancel mm -hmm. certain commitments and um, other things that I'd love to do. And that, that was a hard thing for me to swallow for a long time. Uh, I taught college for 25, more than 25 years. And part of that was involved standing up and giving two or four hour lectures and speaking. And I found out, you know, I couldn't do that after I had heart failure. It just wasn't an option. But I discovered that I could sit down at a desk and write mm -hmm. for hours at a time. I could read, I could write, and I would never have given myself that opportunity in a safer, healthier life. So hmm. I, you know, I often think, uh, in my heart failure circle, one of my friends had posted something and she said, not all storms come to destroy your life. Mm. Some storms come to clear your path. Mm. And I, I think that has been what's happened largely mm. with this. It's like, I, I talk in the book about closed doors um, because the threshold of a closed door is where your faith is really tested. You want that door to open yeah. more than anything. You want to be able to walk through it. But as human beings, 
-hmm. we're often not ready to understand closed doors Mm -hmm. and God rarely explains a closed door. And it's not until we walk through a door that is open and look back at all the other doors that had to be closed for us to find that open door that we understand why all those other doors had to be closed. And, you know, sometimes it's for our own protection. You know, you, we, we avoided that accident or, um, you know, that relationship would not have worked out for you. And sometimes it's for redirection. You know, I think I especially get distracted by too many options. You know, there's too many distractions and God was able to close some doors for Mm -hmm. me and focus me on what he wanted me to do. And I learned that sometimes a closed door is more gracious than an open one. Mm. And so I, while it wasn't my choice and I I can look back and say, I'm still not sure I would choose that. I know that the great planner always provides another door for us. Mm -hmm. When we get those doors slammed in our face or we're trying the handle and it's locked, Mm -hmm. even if we're standing in a, a dark hallway and we can't see a door yet, or we can see it and it just will not open. Mm. That I know that I have a strong conviction now that it will at precisely the perfect time. And I didn't have that perspective before. I mm. I kind of had this idea like I'm going to barge through <laughs> every door I can barge through mm. as fast as I can. Mm-hmm. And God had to say, wait, you know, let's use this for something mm-hmm. different. You know, I think about, uh, you know, it was intended to harm me, but God intended it for good. And that was through those closed doors. Mm. Those are such powerful revelations, hard earned, but powerful revelations. Um, when, when, as your life looked different than you expected, mm. um, the other side of, of this podcast that we also like to talk about our faith leaps. And, you know, I know you are in year, you said you're in year seven of a five-year prognosis with end stage Mm -hmm. heart failure. And during this time, you've had to take the leap of faith to trust God, even when you didn't understand him. Mm -hmm. How have you been able to do that? One of the things that has helped me besides just learning how to lament was that Mm -hmm. I gave myself permission to question. Mm -hmm. I gave myself permission to doubt. Mm -hmm. And there's a whole section in the book on that about what does doubt mean, that question of doubt, because we have to come around it and embrace Mm -hmm. it and wrestle it to the ground Mm -hmm. and really take it back for us to move forward. And it's, you know, I think that when we poke and prod and question and wrestle, our faith doesn't get weaker. It gets stronger Mm. and it gets more focused and um, it gets more defined. Mm -hmm. And we often think that the opposite of faith is doubt, Mm -hmm. but the opposite of faith is indifference. Mm. Just walk away, wipe your hands of it and walk away. And that is what God doesn't want because he's not afraid of questions. And when we contend with him, Mm -hmm. our faith gets stronger. Uh, You know, I think of, um, we have to choose him when we contend with him and question him, we're choosing him again and again Mm -hmm. and again. It's not a decision we we make one time and set up on a shelf and say, there's, Mm -hmm. there's my faith. We, we really actively live it Mm -hmm. and, and wrestle with it. And, you know, I think of when Peter was quoted in John six, and he said, to whom shall I go, Lord, you have the words of eternal life. Mm -hmm. So when we wrestle with this, we're saying, you know, I've looked at it all Mm -hmm. and you're the one with the words of eternal life. Mm -hmm. And so those are, that is one way that I've been able to say, no, it's it's okay to ask you these questions. He wants to hear from us. He does not want the conversation to end and fully understands that being in a hard situation, we've got 
some questions and we've got some issues and, and he just wants to hear from us. Hmm. So good. So good. Well, I know we could probably talk on and on about, uh, this topic peak that affects all of us. Hmm. Um, and so I'm sure for those of us who want to find out more or get your book or find out more about you and what you do, where can they find you online? I'm at lorianwood.com and that's just L-O-R-I-A-N-N-W-O-O-D.com. Awesome. Well, Lori, thank you so much for sharing a glimpse into your journey, you know, the good, the bad, and the ugly, and just, you know, sharing from a place of, of scars, not wounds, to where you have some revelation and some healing in places that really matter in our soul and our spirit so that you can take each day head on with Jesus and with purpose for what the each day holds and the gift and the beauty of each day that God has given you. So thank you for sharing your heart with us. Mm, thank you. It's great to be here. Well, y'all, um, I hope you'll take a look at Divine Detour. Um, For those of you who maybe your life has not worked out the way that you thought, or you have a loved one who's in maybe the pit right now in that valley or just in a season of transition and question. And like Laurieann so beautifully said, the questions and the doubt are a good place to be. God is not afraid of that. God welcomes that. He's with us. I love what she was talking about, lament, and how that comes from a place of faith, not a place of doubt. So I think sometimes we have been brought up or somehow our culture has has put what a relationship with Jesus looks like in this box. And for some of us, that box is like really pretty and blingy. And for other of us, that box is is hard and full of pain and suffering. And I think even with the the few minutes we've had to hear with Lori Ann, we've been able to hear that it's not an either or, it's a both and, and that Jesus is with us through it all. Well, thank you for joining us here today at my Full Life and Faith Leaps podcast. And I look forward to being with you again next time. Well, friends, thank you for joining us today on My Full Life and Faith Leaps podcast. If you enjoyed our time together and are taking away a nugget that has inspired your soul and success, would you share this episode with a loved one who could use it too? And if you haven't already, take a moment to rate and review this podcast and help me help others fuel and fulfill their faith journeys. Until next time, I'm Tiffany Jo Baker, a three-time surrogate, speaker, and strategizer who loves to help you birth your God-given dreams at home and around the world. Now go do all the things God has called and created you to do with the grace and gifts God has given you.